Okay, let's have a look at the data that was recorded on the Android tablet log file. So we're looking at altitude versus time here. Uh, Runtime is just the time since the liftoff. So this is in seconds on the horizontal axis and meters in the vertical there. And the highest recorded point that it reached was just over 25,000 meters. And you'll see a sort of a, a flattened off bit here. That's because there's actually some missing data. Um, so this curve is not a full curve. It just so happens that most of the missing data uh, is a, because it's a straight line, it kind of doesn't show up very much. But if we look at some of these other um, graphs that we'll get to in a minute, I'll just show you this one quickly to show you what how much data was missing. So there's a big chunk there between 10,000 meters and about 13,000 meters, and then another chunk missing between about 22 and 23 or something like that. But as you can see, um, that's that's at least 60%, maybe even 70%. Anyway, let's go back to this one. Um, yeah, so we didn't we don't actually know what the highest point it reached was because I was sitting in my car talking to you, recording a video right at the time. Um, but if you extrapolate this line up a little bit like that and this line up, or this curve as it would curve like that, somewhere right about where the tip of my mouse cursor is right there is probably where it got to. So I wouldn't be too surprised if it actually made it to about 27,000 meters overall. Um, and you can see the the curve is going up a little bit here, so it's actually climbing faster as it rises and obviously falling slower as it falls. Uh, these are the inside and outside temperatures and the yellow is the humidity. So you can see the enclosure was working fairly well because there's a good 20 degrees or so difference between them. The lowest outside temperature recorded was just just under 50, uh, just under minus 50 rather. And looks like, um, what's that? Oh, I should have looked at this, but it's sort of 28, minus 28 for the inside temperature. And there's a little bit of a delay on the inside temperature changing because it has to get through that insulation. Uh, and then it warmed up again until about, um, so this 10,000 mark here is 10,000 seconds is where it burst, I think it was. Yeah, just on 10,000 seconds, that's a nice round number. It looks like it burst just there. And then as it fell down again, it went through that cold patch. But because it was moving faster on the way down, it didn't really have enough time to cool to this lower temperature as it fell. Um, and then as it got back to ground level, it raised back up to, well, it didn't quite get up to zero degrees on the inside. <laughs> so the insulation was working in reverse there was keeping it cool. Uh, the humidity, yeah, I'm not sure what's going on here. I don't think it was supposed to go to negative values, but um, maybe these um, SI7021 sensors that I'm using, they're just not supposed to be used for that sort of a low humidity range. Maybe they're only accurate for, say, 10 degrees upwards or something like that. Anyway, on we go. Uh, so this is temperature versus altitude, and this is both on the way up and on the way down and you can probably tell which is which because the two upper ones here will be on the way up and this is when I was just standing at home watching it for a while and we have lots and lots of strong readings coming in and so this lower one here is that one going up and then it balloon bursts here and then on the way back down uh, as we just saw it doesn't get to go quite as cold on the way down um, but let's just ignore the on the way down one and just look at on the way up so that gives it a little bit clearer uh, way to look at it uh, because if it's moving fast through the air we're not really picking up a good reading for the temperature change um, so anyway same same numbers minus 52 uh, perhaps there the only thing that's sort of noteworthy here is this funny little change here which uh, up at about what is that two and a half kilometers it sort of goes cold and then it goes warm again it's kind of weird uh, what have we got here? This is inside temperatures comparison. So this is comparing the dedicated temperature sensor inside with all of the other things that are inside that um, were there for other reasons. But these things all have their own temperature sensor in them. The barometers and the accelerometer and the humidity sensor all have <clears throat> their own temperature readings. And I was just curious to see how far away they were from the more... Uh, likely to be more accurate temperature sensor, which is the red. And the only one that's really off is the accelerometer, the MPU 6050. You can see that's way off. It's almost, uh, what is that? It's probably about 8 degrees off there. 
at the worst point but all of the other ones are very very close so one reason I wanted to check this is because if if there were some that were quite close for example the MS5611 is very close so I'm thinking that maybe in future builds I don't actually need to have any dedicated temperature sensors um, I could just have a MS5611 inside only um, for the outside temperature sensor though you, I think you'd still need one of those dedicated ones because they can go down to minus 55 whereas these other sensors are supposed to only go to minus 40 but anyway um, yeah it looks like for the inside reading any one of these other sensors apart from that one would be okay to to use this is lateral speed or horizontal speed versus runtime um, it's fluctuating just a little bit there but it was quite slow at the beginning and then as it got up into the upper regions oh, this is time here isn't it uh, we'll look at altitude in a second but uh, as it got into the upper regions it was going at the fastest it got to was about looks like about 26 meters per second which is uh, what is that 75 ish kilometers per hour I think uh, and then on the way down probably at the same altitude it did as well and then it dawdled around a lot in between that as we'll see and I'll show you a 3d um, 3d view of the flight path and we'll see that it just sort of dawdled around going not really anywhere at that point uh, this is horizontal speed versus altitude so we can see that at the 15,000 meter mark was where it was doing that fastest sideways movement and at 20,000 meters it was basically going nowhere again um, so this is now vertical speed versus time and as we saw at the beginning of the flight it was only rising at two meters per second so this is velocity down meaning that a negative number here is actually the balloons going up so it was going up at two meters per second which we were all very disappointed to see and it sort of gradually got a little bit faster as it went until here when it burst, yeah look at that, just on 10,000 seconds and then it jumped up to, or jumped down to rather uh, minus 23-ish at the fastest and then quickly slowed down as it got lower and the highest we saw is I think 5.8 I mean the lowest speed as it fell was 5.8 there and this is vertical speed versus altitude so that's interesting the uh, yeah I guess it would look the same as that on the bottom um, yeah so two meters through to about 3.9 meters per second upwards and now we can see at at what altitude uh, at what speed it was doing at what altitude on the way down uh, okay this is air pressure versus time um, I thought that these two barometers would give me fairly different readings actually in my um, experience using these on quadcopters I found the MS5611 is usually the best but only by a little bit um, so I just sort of thought that maybe it would give me different readings here but it's almost exactly the same here uh, and once again even though we have a big a big lump of data missing here which is uh, well, it's about there I think it doesn't look like it because this even though it's a straight line the straight line fits into the curve quite nicely uh, so that is pressure and then this is pressure versus altitude so it's just these these two again but there uh, there is a green showing there but they're almost on top of each other so you can't see the green very well um, and again oh yeah this the other reason I thought these might be different is because in the stats the BMP 280 is only quoted to work down to 300 um, what do you call it 300 millibar so it should have started to go weird at about this point here and somebody actually commented on this in my last video um, but I guess maybe they they only say that so that customers don't get mad if it um, if it works better than what they've quoted it to work at nobody will complain so they're just erring on the side of caution when they only specify it to work up to that uh, down to that pressure but it looks like they're pretty much the same uh, this is altitude from the GPS which is the blue one versus the two uh, barometers and the barometers are using a uh, pressure altitude 
formula that I got from Wikipedia. I'm not sure if it's the best there is, but um, it seems to be okay. And uh, they are pretty much the same until sort of about... Uh, do we have a... Oh, I should have put what altitude this is here, but... Um, but anyway, the point is they do diverge as they get higher, and the MS5611 is giving closer values to the GPS than the BMP280, even though it's kind of weird, isn't it? They look almost exactly the same on here, but when you use that pressure formula, it uses some um, power formulas like raising things to the power, and it tends to diverge things a lot quicker there, I think. But anyway, um, so... Looking at this, we might might not have actually made it to 25,000 meters, really. I'm not sure which of these should be trusted more, but uh, if we take the middle range, um, perhaps it only got to about 22, 23,000 meters instead of 27. <laughs> uh, so this is from the accelerometer. The yellow and the green are the horizontal axes, so they're not really doing much at all. They are close to zero but uh, I guess this is not really calibrated too well these should be centered on zero really I think uh, and then again we have some big patches missing there and when the balloon starts to fall uh, it starts shaking around a little bit more violently not not too much though I mean it's not really going above 0 0.2 G sideways in either direction which is quite quite surprising I thought it'd be shaking around a lot more than that and the vertical acceleration as it's rising, this is stuck pretty close to 1, or minus 1. And I think in theory it should be actually a little bit more than that. No, it's it's a pretty pretty constant speed, 2 meters per second upwards, isn't it? So um, I guess 1g, one, one yeah, that's right. And interestingly, at this height, or this time rather, it starts to change a little bit in vertical and this would have been when it's moving faster horizontally so getting into the wind currents um, but it's strange that the side to side acceleration wasn't really affected there at all so that's a little bit weird and then when it falls the average of the g-force goes to about 1.15 1 1 or something like that and it's slowly getting less and less. So I presume that this is the effect of the parachute acting as a brake. So you could consider that the parachute breaking it as it falls down is is actually accelerating it upwards because when it starts to fall it's moving at 20 something meters per second and by the time it's gotten to the bottom of the fall it's only moving at 5 meters per second so it's being accelerated up if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, it's just a slight acceleration though, 0 0.1 uh, meters per second squared upwards above the normal acceleration. Does that make sense? I think it does. Anyway, uh, this is the signal quality of the cell phone module versus altitude. So anything above 3 or 4 seemed to, to work okay for sending messages to the web server. And you can see it pretty quickly got up to... Uh, really really strong signal here and it held that until it got to about 1200 meters or so and then it just lost it completely for a little while and then it gained it again so what I suspect happened here is it's probably just switched to a different cell tower for the second bit here and then it just got too high for that one as well and that was the last we saw of this <laughs> for almost the entire flight until the last sort of two minutes as it fell down um, yeah, so you can see that that wasn't really that useful. Um, even up here, yeah, you're even sort of starting to push it if you expect it to work at a thousand meters even. So I was expecting that this would be uh, a lot stronger up to a higher altitude, but I guess not. Okay, this is the last graph, battery versus time. So it started just under nine volts and sort of depleted at the sort of a fairly constant slow pace. Uh, notice that the vertical scale here is in 0 0.2 volts per division so it's uh, it's actually going down very very slowly and it looks like these batteries are very very resistant to temperature so it's quite hard to tell that it's sagging really. It, it is but the only reason we can sort of tell that it's sagging is that 
when it gets past that really cold point and the temperature warms up a little bit around here unfortunately we only have a few little data points there but the fact that it went up after that point proves that this is actually cold temperature sag rather than just normal um, depletion and also here again right at the end it uh, actually regains a fair bit of voltage when it gets back to ground temperature uh, ground level temperatures there so the temperatures there were what were the temperatures hold on a second um, so it looks like in interior temperature was, was about zero degrees at that last point yeah so even at zero degrees it sort of rise back up to eight point three volts almost um, so this is a three almost a three and a half hour flight and it only used well nine minus eight point three what's that zero point seven volts not <laughs> not much of a change really was it these batteries could go for much much longer and here's a 3d view of the flight path or the latter part of it at least so you can see if we turn it this way it rose and it as it rose it rose quicker and quicker as it went along so the slope of this path is gradually getting steeper actually it gets quite a bit steeper here doesn't it and you can see it's actually going back as I mentioned in my other video um, right about here was as oh no it would have been probably about here this was the as far as I would calculated for so I didn't know what it was going to do above that altitude so I just assumed it was going to keep going along like that which is why I thought it might it might end up in the ocean but um, just to piss me off or just to be awkward it went back and if we ooh, tip this uh, this this thing is all backwards I hate it so if we look down there you can see it's uh, didn't really go anywhere much horizontally between 17 kilometers and 25 kilometers just sort of dawdling around and then it decided to come back down over here and you can see that last section there as it went into the middle of the trees um, and then another reason I think there were enough reasons given last in the last video for why I didn't go and pick to try and find this but another reason is that uh, look at the slope there so this is the last point that I got and that's what I was looking at on my map and that's where I would have headed to try and find it now assuming that the beeper was going and assuming that the uh, the whole the whole thing was still powered up and running I might have been able to get some radio signal if I went to this location but even if I went here it wouldn't have been there I think it would have been more like about here um, yes yeah, so if it when it touched down if it got damaged to the point where the battery was no longer powering things and the beeper wasn't running and the radio wasn't transmitting or even if the, there was sort of a, a outcrop of hill or something in the way that blocked the radio signal even if I went here I still might not have found it so um, not much else to say really I think I'll, I'll put the links I'll put these um, files on my web server if you want to have a look at them as um, PNG files yourself and this KML file if you have Google Earth you can open this and have a look at it um, yeah so that's about it for this video series I think I do have three more balloons and I have enough helium to do one more balloon so I will definitely do something like this again weather permitting of course uh, the only thing I don't have is a parachute so like I say I might try making one or I might just get lazy and buy another one but uh, I can't just rush out and do it tomorrow so I don't know when I'll do it but I will do it again and hopefully next time I'll be able to put that little run cam FPV camera on it and we'll get some video maybe anyway that's it for now thanks for watching and I'll see you next time